Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. We are here with Madison Bringle. Yeah. A veteran on the tour. Think about it, you're 30 years old, 31 now. 32 tomorrow. 32 tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and that puts you in vet status. Thank you. So I'm proud of that. I, yeah. Vet, respected, one of the most feared players on tour. It's kind of like when the draw comes out, other than obvious seeds, Madison Bring was one of the names like, okay, let me just not play Madison. Okay. That's, that's a good compliment. Thank you. It is, yeah. it is totally a good compliment because yeah. you have that game. You're mature. You understand the tour. You understand how to play, understand how to win. So a lot of people like fear that. They kind of look for like an easy win, a little quality, a little young person who's going to get out there on the big court and shit themselves. Okay. That's not matter. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I want, like, no matter what happens, I want to make it a long day for whoever. Like, I would just want to make it as tough as possible. If I'm having an off day, you can still do stuff out there. So, you don't, know, like, option B, option C, just keep going through, <laughs> go through the alphabet. Right. Yeah. But that only comes from experience. So, tell me about how you got into tennis, right? Because you don't come from, like, a legacy. Your mom is a tennis coach. Yeah. Right? And But you come from Delaware. And, like, I'm from the Midwest. And so, like, out here on tour, you're like, oh, you got to be from Florida. California, Texas, they forget about the Jack Sox, who's from the Midwest, mm -hmm. and Andy Roddick was from, you know, like, yeah. up in there. Tell us about how you got into tennis in Delaware and made it out of Delaware. So, my mom played tennis growing up, um, but I grew up playing on lightning fast indoor courts in Delaware, and there wasn't really anybody to practice with when I was younger. Now there's, like, there's more junior players now. Um, but growing up, I would play with men when they got off work. So on like the fastest indoor courts, and these were like men in their 40s that would serve in volley on like lightning fast indoor courts. So that's why my forehand just slides across the inside of the ball because like six year old me wasn't strong enough. So that's kind of how the game developed. And I never really drilled much. Like I just grew up like they would want to warm up for five minutes and you play points. So like from the get go, it was always playing matches. And I feel like that was kind of how, like, you, f you figure out a way, because, like, I was this big. So, yeah. <laughs> so did your mom coach you your entire life, or was she like, I'm going to introduce her, I'm going to transition her, so I don't become that crazy tennis parent who, like, starves her and doesn't feed her because she had a bad practice? No, I definitely love food. Um, where nobody's <laughs> going to take my, me my meals away. But she, she coached me until I was about, like, 16, and then I, I went down to Florida. But I went, I didn't, I like that I didn't go down and train in that, like, academy-type setting until I was a little bit more of an established player. So like, I feel like I kind of found my own game and then I was able to get the benefit of it because it worked out for me. Yeah, you can get lost in the academies, right? And yeah. I always tell people sometimes to be the big fish in a small pond in like Peoria, Illinois or Delaware, you get all the attention. Yeah. You know, like everyone wants to play with you and you get a lot of favor. And sometimes having like that energy and that support behind you versus being one of the other kids at Everett, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you don't get the attention and the care. And I think that's what you need if you, like, want to do more than college. Yeah. You need for, like... I, I think that's a really good point, yeah. So, but you, but there is a benefit to training with, like, I mean, the better people you play with, you're going to get better. But I think you almost want to find that a little bit older. Mm -hmm. I, I think that helped me a lot. So your mom pops out every now and then. Mm -hmm. But not that often. No. So tell me what, what's that like now? Like when you like want to hire a coach, do you call her and say, Mom, what do you think about this guy? Or when she sees you struggling and she says, all right, I'm coming to get this shit back on the... Uh, we, we've reevaluated that a little bit. Um, so she shows up more when I'm down in Florida for a practice week because she wants me to cook. So, oh. yeah, it's, she comes less and less to tournaments. So it's, it's more mom now than coach. So I know you're a wine connoisseur, but mm. you talked about your cooking now. When did you become so domesticated? Um, when I bought my house in Bradenton, because I had trained in Boca, and the food that we were given was just atrocious. <laughs> and then when I got my own house, that was like that was such an important thing to me. It was like just to start getting better at cooking. And my dad, he's a really good cook, so like I I grew up around that a little bit. But then when I like got into it, I loved it. So. Talk about food. We'll stay on the food for a little mm -hmm. bit. Food. So, you know, when you look at your, you know, sort of your, your schedule, right, mm -hmm. over the past 14 years. Yeah. You've played in everywhere. 
Mm -hmm. Right? Small tournaments, big tournaments, 125s, 250s, like all of that. I've done a lot of challenges. You've done a lot of challenges. <laughs> <laughs> so when you first drop down in the city, like every player has like their favorite food, whether it's Indian or pasta. Yeah. And you drop your bag down and you pull up, you know, what's around you. What's the first type of food that you're like looking to see where it is in relation to the hotel? Hmm. I feel like I, if I'm eating out on the road, I want to get something that I'm not making at home. So I don't. I'm not good enough at making sushi, so if I can find really, really good sushi, that's probably like high on the list because I don't do that myself. Yeah. And bottle of wine. Mm. So. Like not in my luggage. Like, like not. In your, <laughs> but maybe well, it's, the, a, the maybe one, it's in my the luggage. The one that you bring in your luggage, <laughs> and then the one you try to find, like when you're in Rome, to yeah. try to bring home and add to your collection. Uh, I don't know, like, I don't really seek out that much, like, oh, this specific bottle in that city. It just kind of depends, like, especially if Arena Rodianova, if she she's at a tournament, then we're seeking out different bottles, and that is so much fun. <laughs> she's a good time. <laughs> she is a good time. She's a very good time. And during COVID, your room was like the party room, right? You, like, brought your own stash. Mm, yeah, we had board games. We had wine. I even, like, up to the U.S. Open during that bubble, because we drove my car up and we had my coffee machine, but we had attached rooms. So she would get so upset if I forgot to open the attached door because she couldn't get the coffee in the morning. It was, it, we had so much fun. <laughs> Total wine deliveries, it was fantastic. So with all the stops that you've been on tour, what is your favorite stop on tour? It doesn't have to be a slam, it doesn't have to be women yeah. or anything like that. Favorite stop on tour and then least favorite. Mm, okay. Um, I do love Melbourne because I get to stay at Arena's house. So it's nice just having a little bit, like getting away from the tournament. You kind of relax and I love doing my own laundry. Like, yeah. So I, I really like Melbourne and the food there is great. Uh, least favorite, last year we had uh, a 125 in Concord, Massachusetts. And it was the scariest hotel I've ever been at. <laughs> yeah, it was terrifying. So. Mm. And the supervisor here, she was at the tournament, and she's like, we still can't, like, she's like, it's too soon, can't talk about it. But really? That hotel was that bad. So it wasn't up to the standards. It was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. So at 31 years old, right, you've played every slam, you've done well at the Australian Open, done well at the U.S. Open. What sort of keeps you going, right? And what are your, what are your goals? So when you look back on your career, you're kind of like, all right, I'm happy that I was able to achieve this, this, and this, and my next chapter looks like this. I feel like my goals kind of changed as I got a little bit older. Because when you're younger, everybody kind of has the almost stereotypical boxes that they want to tick. And for me, it changed, especially like, I, I mean, I dealt with the big hand injury and the nerve stuff. So it, I kind of had to adjust. So one of the big things for me a couple of years ago was having won a match in every main draw slam. And when I like ticked that, I was so happy. It's not going to be a big deal to anybody else, but to me, it was like a huge deal. And as long as I can just play and stay healthy enough, like I feel like that's always the key word is enough because we're never like, we're never totally healthy. But if I can just enjoy it and I like the travel, I like the food, I just, I like this job. This is a cool job. It's a good job. So we talk about it being a job, right? And I think that most coaches or very few coaches, kids actually make it. Saviano's kids don't play. Rick Macy's kids don't play. My daughter, I'm like, still frustrated that she doesn't play as okay. much as she would. I said, you know, you've like shared a bed with Sloan, who won a Grand Slam, who got Monica, Taylor Townsend, and you hate tennis. Like, how can you have all that talent mm. in the next room in our house and you don't play? Why do you think that is? Do you have a theory? Well, first of all, I've never tried to coach her. So okay. I, I think that she's a girl mm. and my other two kids are boys. And I think that Tennis has, me traveling, has taken away from her. Okay. And away from the family. Okay. And so I think she resents she everything about the sport. Okay. I think she resents, like, lack of presence or being like, today's my son's birthday, right? So I yeah. think she resents what it's taken away from her. Mm. She's like, yeah, I hate that. Mm. That's, That's just tough. my yeah. theory. Uh, no, I, and for me, looking at it, I like this sport, um, as, a, as a woman trying, playing sports, to make money, there's not many you can you can do it. You, uh, to me, it's golf and tennis. If you want to like have like a good career, and I, I don't know, I like I feel like it would be nice if there were more options for women that you could see it as a career, not just like a side quest. 
like this is not a side quest <laughs> but some people look at like the sports that girls play in college but they don't ever really go pro with it mm -hmm. and i'm like i would like it to be like to be able to be a career I also think that when you think about all the careers within this sport, yeah. whether it's being a tournament director, whether it's being a comms person, whether it's being uh, an umpire, even though like EL, you know, electronic line calling is like taking their jobs, mm. but like all the other <laughs> professions within, in and around tennis, yeah. right? being an agent, like being yeah. a, a female agent, right? Yeah. I think there's a there's a lot of job opportunities, and it's a really cool sport, I think, to be involved in. Yeah. So what did your mom do, right? So I talked about my frustrating experience with my own kid. Even my son like hates it, right? He like mm -hmm. slaps the dog on the ass with a tennis racket, right? <laughs> but, but refuses to hit a ball. Okay. Like he'll like hit you with the racket, but he refuses to put the ball on the strings. Sure. So what did your mom do that perhaps like myself, Macy, you know, like the, the, our kids like went the other way with it? She had me play a lot of sports. It was not just tennis. So I think not like putting me into this like it has to be this it has to be this yes she wanted it to be tennis but i played soccer i played volleyball i was in the band i did ballet yeah no let's not talk about the, my brief stint in the band um but yeah i i did a lot of different stuff so i feel like letting it kind of be my choice was like yeah there were a lot of activities a lot of sports staying active was great but letting it be my choice was probably the most important thing hmm See, I feel like if I gave my kids a choice, they just play video games and watch TV mm. all day. So it's kind of like, yeah, you have some choices, except this one. Mm. I no, I, yeah. So I hear you, but like we had, I I feel bad now. I'm looking back and I'm like, how did they manage to get us to all these activities? Like, yes, it was the minivan life, but like, how did they manage that? Like, that's it that was impressive. But I feel very lucky that I had that many choices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you say the minivan life. Let me give you a minivan story. Mm. <laughs> so 2018 was a good year. Okay. And that was when I had my third kid. And we were looking at Suburbans and Escalades. Okay. And there was like a particular match that didn't go the way it was going. Okay. So I was like, all right, yeah. win this match, it would be an Escalade. Okay. If we lose this match, it would be a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> okay. We lost the match. It's a Honda Odyssey? So then I was still out of town. So my buddy bought the car for me, drove it to my house, dropped it off in the driveway. And my wife was like, what the f is this? Oh, no. I was like, when I get back home, you can ask the team what oh. this is and oh. why it's this instead of that. Ooh. Ooh. So that, what I was saying, it's the best car I've ever owned. Okay. Sliding doors, TV, they can yeah. like pour stuff all over the floor. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. It's okay, but yeah. that, that is my minivan story. Mm -hmm. So my Honda Odyssey should have been an Escalade. Okay, but, but we're happy that it was. We're yeah. happy that it we're was. We're happy that it was. Okay, yeah. So I lived the minivan life. <laughs> I went to a lot of different sporting activities. So I got a last question. So let's just pretend that the 1000s incorporated mix doubles into, you know, more of the draw. And you're like a great doubles player and had a lot of double success. Who would be your dream mix partner i take it you don't know what happened to me the last time i played mixed doubles. <laughs> you're gonna tell me <laughs> oh my okay, god so tell me the story mm. so i played mixed at wimbledon with dustin oh. mm. and well that's wild and crazy experience I mean, you signed up for that I, okay well i felt like i should probably play the backhand side because like my backhand my better shot and he goes no i'm gonna play the ad side i'm the weapon which that's fine you're a guy, that's fine. But I said, listen, like, on the do side, I'm probably not going to get a guy's serve back. Whatever. Do whatever you want. Fine. And my other thing, I was like, I just had a little bit of fear because, like, he, his aim, it can be, it, it, it's, a little all over, it's a little over the shop. So we're playing as a second set, and the guy hits a serve, like, a meter out. And Dustin takes a full crack at the forehand. I was half back. It was the guy's first serve. Caught me in the ear. It broke the cartilage in my ear. So that was the last time I played mixed doubles. So like <laughs> when you're like, who do you want to play mixed doubles with? And I'm like, absolutely no one, please. You were tired yeah. from mix. Uh, I think that was probably, yeah. I, whew, that was, I actually did not go down like a sack of potatoes. I thought I, I thought I would. That did not feel good. Full, like he took a full crack at it. <laughs> Some, someone made a collage of like, the cycle, like me getting hit, the trainer coming out, like it was, yeah, I'll show you the collage. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. So if they bring more mixed in, Madison will... Let me commentate. You'll I can, commentate. I'll commentate, but she's like, please don't put me out there. Like I will do, I will do any, I would ball girl, I would umpire, but like don't make me play mixed ever again.
Done. 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 <laughs> no. Well, thank you for coming on. Of this has been the Tennis.com podcast with Madison Bringle. Thank you for having me.